Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you with fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situations. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Pakistan witnesses spike in targeted killings. India raises Khalistan issue in UK. And security forces in Jammu and Kashmir neutralize Lashkar terrorists. Pakistan grappling with the repercussions of fostering terrorism both as an integral part of its ecosystem and foreign policy confronts a significant hurdle. The defense and intelligence entities, formerly patrons and custodians of this terrorism network, now find themselves incapable of safeguarding it. The imminent collapse of this integrate setup is evident. Yet persistent instances of eliminating both terrorists and civilians within Pakistan prompt inquiries into the nation's overarching security dynamics. We have a detailed report which sheds light on these unfolding events. In a concerning turn of events, Pakistan's security is now grappling with an internal threat to its terror ecosystem. Recent targeted killings, including the death of Maulana Rahim Ullah Tariq, a significant figure in a Pakistan-based terror organization, raise serious questions about the country's security situation. This comes on the heels of the killing of Daud Malik, founder of the terrorist group lashkar e jabbar known for his ties to Masood Azhar, the mastermind behind the 2019 Pulwama attack. The once supportive stance of Islamabad's army and inter-services intelligence agency towards terrorism appears to be shifting as the country experiences a series of targeted killings within just two months. That when agencies like the ISI have been encouraging terrorist elements to act against India and previously against the legitimate Afghan government, they thought that these terrorists, people who were taking money from them, training from them, had their bases in Pakistan, would do Pakistan army's bidding through and through. It doesn't work out that way. Many of them wanted to replicate the Afghan Taliban model within Pakistan itself. Others were more willing to do their bidding. Now it is clear that after some time, now that you have a Taliban regime in Afghanistan, those who want a similar regime in Pakistan have become more emboldened. And what's happening is the following. They, it appears to me, they are targeting those people who they believe will do Pakistan army's bidding against them. So before these people can become active, they, in anticipation of Pakistan's clients becoming active, they are basically taking action against these particular people. The killing of Maulana Rahim Ullah Tariq in broad daylight on Pakistani soil is the fourth incident of targeted killings orchestrated by unknown gunmen in just two months. Prior to Tariq and Malik's death, Shahid Latif, a conspirator behind the 2016 Pathan court attack, and Mufti Kaiser Farooq, a close associate of Hafiz Saeed, the mastermind behind the 2611 Mumbai attacks, met their fate at the hands of unknown assailants within days. Not just the killings of terror associates, but Pakistan's innocent civilians also face a severe security threat in their own country. This is a battle for survival. People who want a Taliban kind of regime for Pakistan know that if they let the other terrorists who do Pakistan's army bidding get away, or if they are not targeted now, later on these forces will target the Pakistani Taliban. So it is best that they are eliminated right now. It is not a fight for prominence. It is a fight for monopoly. It is a fight for safety. They want to ensure that there are no power rivals to attack them or challenge them when they take on the might of the Pakistan army, which they are doing, by the way. These incidents not only claim the lives of terror associates, 
but also pose a grave security threat to innocent Pakistani civilians. The repeated daylight killing suggests a growing risk of comprehensive security collapse, despite past associations with notorious figures like Osama bin Laden, Pakistan now seems quick to point fingers at India and external forces for its security challenges. However, the underlying issue remains the presence of a thriving terror ecosystem within its borders, a reality that Islamabad can no longer evade. India's External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar recently concluded his UK trip where he raised the issue of Khalistan extremism and the safety of Indian High Commission building and personnel. Jay Shankar said that UK should give fullest protection to foreign diplomatic mission so that they could carry out activities in an unrestricted manner. While raising the issue, Jay Shankar also criticised the Canadian politics for giving space to extreme political opinions. Take a look. As I said, India's External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar concluded his five-day trip to the United Kingdom on November 15. During his meetings with the country's leaders, S. J. Shankar raised India's long-standing concerns about pro-Khalistan extremism in the UK. Jay Shankar stressed that the Khalistani elements should be on guard against the misuse of freedom of expression and speech. In October, pro-Khalistani groups had staged a protest outside the Indian Embassy in London following which security was beefed outside the building. Earlier, the Indian High Commissioner to the UK, Vikram Doraiswamy, was stopped from entering a Gurudwara in the city of Glasgow. While raising concerns on the issue, Jay Shankar also criticised the Canadian politics which has given space to violent and extreme political opinions advocating separatism from India. Uh, in Canada, uh, uh, we feel that uh, the Canadian politics has given space to a violent and extreme uh, political opinions. Uh, which uh, which uh, advocates separatism uh, from India, mm. including through violent means. Mm. And these people have been accommodated in Canadian politics. Uh, they have given the freedom to, uh, to uh, articulate their views. Mm. And not just that, uh, it has come to a situation where uh, the diplomats of uh, my country, including the High Commissioner, uh, we've had uh, attacks on the High Commission, uh, smoke bombs thrown at the High Commission. My, high com my Consul General and other diplomats were intimidated in public. Pro-Khalistan supporters abroad have been vandalizing temples and holding referendums in support of their demand. On several occasions, pro-Khalistani groups have demonstrated outside Indian High Commission in Canada, Australia, the United States and the UK. The protests by these pro-Khalistani groups also demonstrate controversial posters. In the past, India has raised the issue with Western countries including UK. The UK government, however, has declared that attacks on the High Commission of India in London are unacceptable. During the G20 meet in New Delhi, UK PM Rishi Sunak had stated that his government is working closely with the Indian government to tackle pro-Khalistan extremism. No form of extremism or violence like that is acceptable in the UK and that's why we are working very closely with the Indian government to particularly tackle PKE, pro-Khalistan extremism. I don't think it's right. Our security minister recently was just in India talking to his counterparts. Uh, we have working groups together to share intelligence and information so that we can root out this kind of violent extremism. It's not right and I won't tolerate it in the UK. The Khalistan narrative has failed to find any traction in India's Punjab and therefore Khalistani elements on foreign soil are showing their desperation. 
these Khalistani elements often raise their own separatist flags while disrespecting India's national flag. However, India has made it clear that it won't accept its national flag being pulled down and any such agenda to break the country. Shifting our attention to Jammu and Kashmir in India, terrorist activities backed by Pakistan aim to disrupt peace in the Union territory. Despite this, the Indian Army, in collaboration with the police, is actively thwarting these efforts committed to preserving tranquility in the region. In a recent operation, security forces successfully neutralized two Lashkar terrorists in the Pulwama district of Jammu and Kashmir. We have a detailed report. On the 11th of November, a fierce confrontation unfolded between security forces and terrorists in the district of Pulwama in Jammu and Kashmir. This intense clash was sparked by actionable intelligence reports hinting at the presence of terrorists in the surrounding area. Swiftly responding to this imminent threat, a coordinated effort between the Indian Army and local law enforcement resulted in the strategic cordoning off of the targeted zone. As the concealed terrorists unleashed a barrage of gunfire, an immediate and decisive response ensued. Recent police briefings confirmed the entrapment of at least two terrorists in Parigram, marking the latest incident merely two days after a terrorist was killed in a prior encounter in Shopian. Now what India can do is, India has many options. First and foremost is the diplomatic options we have seen. But again, in United Nations and in other diplomatic places where China is there, China always comes to defend Pakistan because China has its own problems. They have already invested more than $70 billion in Pakistan, which they find that that money is all gone waste. And Pakistan is again with a begging ball to them. Second option with them, with India is that we, whenever such infiltration takes place, we can counter that by removing that post from where these infiltrators were being pushed in so that the cost of this infiltration comes onto the Pakistan army and the Pakistan rangers itself. Till such time we don't do that, impose that cost, Pakistan will keep trying that. Third is that we can always, we have tried the friendship part that has not worked. Today there is no trade relations between India and Pakistan and it is very clear that the establishment will not uh, uh, come to India or rather have any relations with India because they cannot afford it, because their own people will be against it. So what India can do is ensure that all the other countries which are there, like which are the supporters of Pakistan, where Pakistan keeps going, whether it is the Arab countries or whether it is America and all, and use their diplomatic channels to pressure Pakistan to stop uh, sending in the terrorists. A large number of terrorists with backing from Pakistan remain concealed within Jammu and Kashmir persistently seeking opportunities to execute acts of terror and disrupt the peace within the region. Yet despite the nefarious intentions harbored by Pakistan-based terrorist counter-terrorism operations have exhibited remarkable success in quelling the menace within Jammu and Kashmir. In the month of September this year, security forces successfully eliminated Uzair Khan, the commander of lashkar e taiba a key figure responsible for orchestrating a heinous attack on a joint team of Jammu and Kashmir police and the army in Gadol village. This attack resulted in the tragic loss of two esteemed army officers and a valiant Jammu and Kashmir police officer. Many experts opine that these operations have left anti-social elements in the region feeling powerless as heightened scrutiny is applied to their logistical and financial support networks. Pakistan's persistent endeavors to disrupt the peace in India is not a new phenomenon. It is the Pakistan ISI only which is doing this because they have now found out that all these people who were there as master minds in, during the 90s when the terrorism was started, Operation Topak was started, all these people were the leaders at that time and today they have now become defunct. Because we have seen when in uh, 1991, when the uh, Article 370 was abrogated, Pakistan had sent out instructions 
to all these people over there to again revive terrorism in, in Jammu and Kashmir, which they have failed to do so. Pakistan, now, the ISI and the army have realized that these people do not have a cadre anymore over here in India, which is going to listen to them. So now what they are doing is they are eliminating all these people because as it is these people who are on the prescribed list of the United Nations and America and others and Pakistan was getting a bad name for them. And for all for what? Because now these people's utility has finished. Pakistan's use and throw policy has come into play. It is the Pakistan ISA which is eliminating all these people because it cannot be in the Indian intelligence sources which are doing that. In response to these unrelenting attempts, India has meticulously implemented a comprehensive framework designed to thwart individuals dispatched and supported by Pakistan. This multifaceted approach involves the border security force intercepting drones engaged in the illicit transport of drugs and ammunition on Indian soil, while the National Investigation Agency conducts targeted raids to disrupt the financial networks supporting terrorists within India. Furthermore, India's deeply entrenched intelligence network plays a pivotal role by supplying crucial information that informs ground-level counter-terrorism operations conducted by the police and the army, thereby ensuring the preservation of peace in the Union territory despite Pakistan's recurrent malevolent endeavors. Thousands of Afghans from various regions of Pakistan are making their way back to their parents' war-torn country. Those who are returning to their homeland after two years, they are having a hard time recognizing the cities they left behind, where music is forbidden and schools are now closed for girls. The Pakistani government has been urged by international organizations to stop harassing and deporting Afghan refugees. A report. Thousands of Afghans from the different parts of Pakistan are returning to the war-ravaged country their parents were born in. For many who are returning to their country after two years, they are finding it difficult to recognize the city they fled, where schools are now closed for girls and music is prohibited. According to reports, over 3 lakh people have returned to Afghanistan in recent weeks. Tens of thousands of nearly 1.7 million undocumented Afghans have been crossing from Pakistan since November 1, the deadline announced by the Pakistani government for the refugees to leave. Islamabad portrays the deportation drive as long overdue. For decades, Pakistan has hosted millions of Afghans who arrived over several waves of migration beginning in the 1970s. International organizations have called on the Pakistan government to halt the deportation and harassment of Afghan refugees. With winter setting in, the International Rescue Committee in Afghanistan has expressed deep concern about the survival of Afghan refugees arriving from Pakistan. The humanitarian needs at the Tolkien Crossing are immense. We've seen up to 200,000 people arriving since the start of October. And many people are arriving from Pakistan with nothing but the clothes on their back. Many people have not lived here in Afghanistan for decades and so are arriving with no support network, they have no money, and they're forced to sleep at the Tulkan Crossing in tents or just under the open skies. The Pakistani government has not paid heed to the suggestions of the United Nations, rights groups and Western embassies to reconsider the expulsion plan. Islamabad is saying Afghans had been involved in terror attacks and other crimes that undermined the security of the country. Pakistan says that among more than 4 million Afghans who are living in Pakistan, around 1.7 million are undocumented. So we're expecting people to continue arriving from Pakistan for around the next six months. Um, and the crisis conditions that those people will face will remain for the long term. As you mentioned, we're facing winter um, and conditions are going to deteriorate rapidly. Temperatures are going to drop significantly. And also in December, this marks the start of the rainy season. And so people are going to be bearing extremely difficult conditions. Um, and like I said, they'll be sleeping in tents under open sky. 
Many Afghans who fear persecution have gone into hiding in Pakistan to avoid being detected by law enforcement agencies. Some Afghans who converted from Islam to Christianity worry they could be prosecuted if they return. Pakistan's order has sent a shock wave of fear and panic among Afghans in Pakistan. Many Afghans who were born in Pakistan are now going to a country in crisis. The Taliban government has issued a stern warning to Pakistan for its bad treatment of Afghan refugees amid a crackdown on undocumented migrants. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Pratiksha Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.